And so we have to be very, very careful about the religious interpretations that we're given regarding our political realities. If it's one thing that the black church has to be called to task on, as it relates to black men, they have to be called to task on their lack of initiative surrounding mass incarceration. They have to be called to task with the fact that they have done next to nothing to combat the 50% black male unemployment rate, which has been static since the 1980s. When America's unemployment rate hit 9%, the country is thrown into a crisis. Well, black men's unemployment has been at 50% for over 40 years, and yet it still is treated like it's a regular part of our existence. Let's be clear. You cannot separate unemployment of black men from black on black crime. You cannot separate the economic realities of black men from depression and suicide. And guess what else, sisters? You cannot separate the economic outlook for black men from the marriage rate of black women. Let's be clear. The reason why so many brothers are not marrying black women has nothing to do with immaturity. It has nothing to do with them not being committed or serious. A man who is not allowed to carry out his obligations as a man is not in a rush to marry anybody's daughter. The best way you can make a man into a fan or father, the best way you can make a man into a husband is to give him a livable wage earning job. Until we start talking about livable wage earning jobs, don't talk about making a black man a better man. If we go into American history 75 years ago, who was selling the drugs? If we go into America's history 80 years ago, who was running the guns? If we go into America's history 85 years ago, who was running in the rackets? Gambling, breaking the law, getting drunk, getting high in the streets. It wasn't black men. It was Jewish immigrants, Italian immigrants, and Irish immigrants. Why did Jews, Irish, and Italians break the law? Why did they sell illegal, illegal liquor? Why did they run gambling operations? Why were they killing each other in the streets through gangs? Because it wasn't until 1940 that the United States government decided to reclassify Southern Europeans as white folks. Up until 1940, Jews, Irish, and Italians were not considered white folks. They were considered guineas and other names, which peculiarly stroke at the fact that most of them had a little bit of black blood in their DNA. Because the closer you come to Africa on the European continent, the darker the hair and the darker the complexion becomes. But in 1940, the United States government decided to upgrade Jews, Irish, and Italians into white folks, full-fledged white folks. And in doing so, they gave the Irish the police departments of America. In doing so, they gave the Italians the fire departments of America. And in doing so, they gave European Jews the civil service municipal jobs in our city centers that they still dominate and control to this day. In other words, America gave poor white folks an economic stimulus package. Where is the economic stimulus package for black males? Where is the economic stimulus package for black males? see the shows on TV, they say, why are black men killing each other as if they don't understand it? The number one responsibility of a man is to provide and protect. The protection problem ain't a big issue, but the providing problem is. If the most basic responsibility of a man is to provide, when you snatch that from him, when you make him unable to provide that responsibility, that makes him feel inadequate. He gets insecure. That crystallizes into anger. That anger crystallizes into rage. And that rage manifests into violence. That's not just true for black men. It's true for men of any race who are politically and economically marginalized and devastated. Black men in America are in a state of arrested development. It's not that we can't. We are not allowed to. People often look at the non-African immigrants that come into America the Chinese and the Arabs and the East Indians and the Latinos, particularly the non-African Latinos, because most Latinos are of African descent, they just don't like to admit it because we got a big light-skinned supremacy problem running around in the Caribbean. The issue, family, 
is that we gotta give black men jobs. But when you're trying to exterminate an entire population of the society, the last thing you're interested in is giving them jobs. In fact, the reason why prison is so popular is because America has decided that the black man is no longer economically relevant to this reality. In fact, this is not a new thing. It goes back to slavery. When the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865, one of the first decisions Congress made was to limit the procreation of Africans in America and to limit the importation of Africans to America. And right after the Civil War ended, with four million ex-slaves who had skills that they could use, it was tougher than to find jobs. But at the same time that four million ex-slaves could not find work, America imported Chinese and Indian immigrants to work and build the railroads and build the factories. Why are you importing immigrants when you have 44 million ex-slaves who can do the work? It's because during slavery, America had determined that slavery was risky business. It was necessary, but it was risky because the entire capitalistic machine of America depended on the black laborer, which means if we would have revolted, if we would have stopped working, we would have crushed the entire capitalistic system. So after slavery, they had decided that never again will America depend on the black laborer for its economy to prosper. That's why you have so many immigrants now coming in. This is on purpose. This is by design. Make the black man economically irrelevant so you can mass incarcerate him as a pretext to extermination. Now why don't we hear more being said about mass incarceration? Because out of sight is out of mind. And let's be honest, black folk, most of us don't want to do anything for our brothers and sisters coming out of incarceration because we're afraid of the threat that they pose to our own job stability. We have to deal with that situation. We don't have a meaningful reentry program in this country for black men. Most of the time when you're let out of jail, you turn right onto the streets and in many of the halfway houses that are supposed to prepare you to reenter into the society, many of them are guilty of drug dealing inside of the halfway house itself. Under full scope and knowledge of the government, the halfway house ain't nothing but a recriminalization house in many cities in this country. And the fact that 95% of all criminal cases in this country involving black folks are plea bargain right. is absolutely unacceptable. 95% of our men and women, for that matter, in jail are not there because they committed a crime. They're there because they cannot afford to prove that they did. And this is where the church also has to be taken to task. Why isn't the black church financing lawsuits in major movements that seek to force a reconstruction of the criminal code? I understand a couple weeks ago, President Obama, uh, what did he do? He saw to it that a large amount of black folk unjustly criminate, criminalized in the criminal justice system were released. And a lot of black people celebrated that. I did not celebrate that. And the reason I did not celebrate that, because if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he'll eat for the rest of his life. Obama didn't change the law. He just simply let a few of us out. And by letting a few of us out, the rest of us looked at that like it was some sort of blessing. That was no blessing. It's no different when I read articles talking about America has a larger black middle class. We should all clap because America has a larger black middle class. That does nothing for me. So you're telling me that we got a few more bougie Negroes that we got to fight on our way to crushing white racism. I don't care about the black middle class. I'm going to talk about the black underclass, which is 20 times larger than the black middle class. Do an article on that. Let's talk about that. You young brothers in college, you need to take very careful consideration of what you're studying while you're in the university. Because too many of our young people are majoring in degrees that are not economically relevant. Every university offers over 150 degree programs, most of them. But of that 150 degree programs, only 20 of them are economically relevant. If you're going to go to college, you have to make sure that you can pay those student loans off when you get out. 
Because in America today, we have over 2 million African Americans with master's and doctorate degrees who cannot find work. So college in and of itself is not a recipe for success. It can be a recipe for disaster if you are not majoring in the right fields. You have to be careful about letting your academic advisors persuade you to leave a career that you want, to major in something they want you in. Because what happens at the university level when certain majors are filled up, the provosts and the different department chairs automatically they have meetings and they say, okay, we already have too many pre-law majors, or we have too many pre-med majors, we have too many engineering majors, so we gotta find a way to influence them to study something else. One of the strategies they do is they raise up the QPA you need to register for that major. So they say, you need a 3-5 to be pre-law, you only got a 3-2, why don't you go be a gym teacher? This is what they do. Your Q ain't high enough, I'm sorry, but there's no more room for you here. This is how they control black people's access to education in certain disciplines, even when you're in the college. So we have to be able to look out for that. And the next thing you know, you graduate magna cum laude with a PhD in grasshopper reproduction. <laughs> the hell are you going to do with a PhD in grasshopper reproduction? Earthworm technology. Medieval 18th century European art. What job is waiting for you with that type of stuff? You got a general liberal arts degree. You so liberal, you will be liberal liberated from finding a job too. Make sure your major counts. Yes, you got the major in something you love, but you got to make sure that it's also relevant. And you young brothers got to make sure you do well early. You come to college and you goof off and screw around early. That's a mistake. Classes are easiest as a freshman. Classes are easiest as a sophomore. You should be finishing up your freshman and sophomore year, both semesters, all four, with a perfect 4.0. Freshman year is not the year to be going to the frat parties. In fact, freshman year is not the year to be joining a fraternity. You don't even have a QPA yet. What you doing, pleasure? And you brothers in these fraternities pledging these boys as freshmen, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know what you want to put them through. They don't even have a QPA yet. Should be pledging at least to your second semester sophomore year, you taking them in as freshmen. Because you're thirsty for more membership. How about go back to the principles of why your fraternity was founded in the first place? Start there. You'll get all the members you need. It wasn't started for party marching and step show concerts. It was started as a secret society to fight for black equality in this society. Not a hip hop show. Discipline, gentlemen. The one thing black men need more of is discipline. All of us do. What is discipline? It's the ability to do what you don't feel like doing. When it has to be done, whether you like it or not. I don't care how intelligent you are. I don't care how talented you are. As a school psychologist, I give IQ tests for a living. I regularly come across young brothers with 150, 160 IQ. Intellectually, genius. But what good is that type of intellectual blessing if you don't have the determination to go with it? If you don't have the persistence and dedication to go with it? If you don't have the discipline to go with it? Discipline is divine. And the degree of discipline that you build into your character will determine how far you go in life. I always say Michael Jordan wasn't the greatest basketball player. We'll never know who the greatest basketball player was. But Michael Jordan gets the title because Michael Jordan had the discipline and dedication to work his craft. Talent means nothing unless you got the character to chisel it out into perfection. That's where a lot of us are lacking. And for my mothers in the audience raising those young boys back home, you got to do a better job. Y'all spoiling them too much. You letting your sons get away with murder too much. I don't mean murder literally, but just figuratively. In some cases, literally. You cannot spoil your son. You cannot keep making excuses for your son. He is a black man in a racist society. The society is looking forward to your son making mistakes. 
so they can disadvantage the rest of his life. There's no second chances for black men out here. So why does your son get five and six at home? There's no second chances for black men out here. So why does your five-year-old get eight or nine times to mess up before he gets a consequence? And then when he gets the consequence, he can talk you out of it. He can make you feel sorry for what he did wrong. That's not how you raise a boy. In other words, and it's not fair that so many mothers have to raise black men on their own, but sisters, you have to be careful not to be turning your son into the exact type of man that you yourself would never want to marry. Exactly, exactly. We have a lot of that going on. Why these men ain't responsible? Because his mother didn't make them responsible. In fact, I'm finding out that most of our boys are learning their negative beliefs about black women from black women, not men. So that's another situation that has to be taken advantage of. So young brothers, get in here, get your work done, get out. You're going to have to go to grad school. Most of you will not be able to live happily ever after with a bachelor's degree. So don't come to the University of Memphis and be a super senior. <laughs> not getting your degree till you're almost 30 years old with no excuses for that. Just hanging around because you don't want to grow up. Get in here, do your four, and you got to get right back in into that master's program or into that doctorate program and finish the job. But you're going to need that discipline. What are the four disciplines that are most important for a black man? Sexual discipline. Because the Lord knows we don't need no more kids without their daddy running around here. We gotta practice sexual discipline. Very, very important that we practice sexual discipline. I tell you young brothers right now, if you are thinking with the wrong head, you will have a hard life. You better learn how to think with this one because that other one is retarded. <laughs> Second discipline is economic. We got to learn how to save better. It's not how much you make, it's how much you save from what you make. This is a terrible time of the calendar year for black folks because it's holiday season time. So over the next couple of weeks, black folks in Memphis who barely got two dimes to rub together are gonna to spend 10 dimes on useless gifts that don't nobody even need. Cell phones and clothes and video games. You cannot wait to get on out the Walmart. In fact, Walmart waiting on you right now. Target, Kitty City, Toys R Us, they waiting on you right now. Amazon, they stocked up for black folks. Standing in line around the corner to buy Christmas gifts. Somebody gonna have to explain to me how love for a man in Jesus Christ who did not believe in materialism. How does a holiday dedicated to Jesus Christ get perverted into a shopping spree for European capitalism? Somebody will have to explain that to me. Christmas ain't got nothing to do with shopping. But that's how capitalism can get you to make you think you can actually improve your happiness by buying more things for yourself. They're very good at doing this. You turn on a commercial, and every commercial has happy people eating chicken. So you want some chicken, you might feel happy. <laughs> happy people driving a Mercedes. Let me buy a Mercedes. Maybe I will feel happy. They're not selling a Mercedes. They're selling happiness. You believe by getting the product that you want to feel better. You go out and get the Mercedes, and for four weeks, you feel better because you got that Mercedes high. Until that first car door is doing it, you drop into a bowel of depression. <laughs> Black folks and their economic spending habits. And I tell our black economists all the time, the reason why we can't deal with the economic problems of black men and women is because we fail to understand that the shopping addiction of black people is tied to the low self-esteem of black folks. Black people don't buy because you need, you don't even buy because you want. You buy because you think it adds value to your life that you feel has none at all. It's not about having the endurance, but by having the endurance, I feel like I'm a better man today than I was yesterday. It's a psychological stimulus package. You bought that Louis bag, not because you needed the Louis bag, not even because you liked the Louis bag, but if the Louis bag is worth $500, you now feel you worth $500 more. Mm. Until you deal with the low self-esteem of black folks, you can't deal with no other problem that black folks have because it all stems from our psychological residuals of slavery. Our 21st century Willie Lynch, our post-traumatic slavery disease, our wanting to be white while all the time wanting to deny our blackness. That's the reality of the situation. 
somebody one day gonna have to do a study on whether or not sending all these black folks to college has even benefited black folks. I haven't seen any proof that college educated Negroes have been of any benefit to the race. Because most of you have the same opinions, ideas, and beliefs as middle class white America. You cannot wait to volunteer your negative opinion against your own people. Part of that is our fault because most of black America is addicted to only being accepted by white America. You're not looking for independence. And church has hurt us because church has made us feel like it's evil to want power. It's evil to want control. It's evil to have authority over something. No one in America is looking to uh, participate with other people. Everybody's looking to accumulate power. Chinese come to America to accumulate power. Asians come to America to accumulate power. Arabs and East Indians come to America to accumulate power. And black folks simply want to participate with others. <laughs> You're going to participate yourself out of existence. You don't cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> multiculturalism. What is that? Who practices multiculturalism? When you go to a Chinese store, is it multicultural in there? They own it, they work it, they benefit from it. You go to the banks of America, does it work multicultural at the banks? Well, nobody practice multiculturalism. They practice intra-group economic solidarity. They build a wall around their culture, and if you don't belong to this race, you don't benefit from what we do. That's how the world operates. Everybody but black folks. You're the only people who don't want to admit who you are and what you are. Chinese proud to be Chinese, East Indian proud to be East Indian, European Jew proud to be a European Jew, Irishman is proud to be an Irishman, and you just want to be a child of God. <laughs> I'm a human being. I don't see no color, but that's the problem, because if you don't see color, you don't see your own children. And if you don't see color, you can't see the racism that's being directed at your own children. Last thing we need is another generation of colorblind black folks. Have you realized that every organization for black folks is colorblind? Every fraternity is colorblind. That's right, every last one of y'all colorblind. Every sorority is colorblind. The NAACP is colorblind. The Urban League is colorblind. Congressional Black Caucus is colorblind. You're the only race in the world that doesn't have a single organization that looks out for you and nobody else. <laughs> Where's the all the African groups? Ain't none. In fact, you go to a meeting, there's nothing but black folks in it. A couple black folks who have a heart attack. They jump up and say, wow, we're the only ones here. We will get an attitude because we don't see nobody else. I just came from the Caribbean Islands talking to them about the white Jesuses I see all over the place. Y'all got them in Memphis too? 90% of Memphis churches pray to white Jesus. A painting created in 1482 by Leonardo da Vinci by the Pope. 1482, and that picture is still hanging up in 90% of our religious institutions. And you are comfortable with it. You are the only race that prays to a deity that's in the image of another people. You raise your sons with that image. Because you don't understand mental science. When babies are brought up with the image of another people as God, their brain will draw a general conclusion that all people of that race must also be godly too. And so our kids suffer from an inferiority complex, and that inferiority complex wasn't brought on by public school, it was brought on by Sunday school. <laughs> Black men, we got an addictions problem. Alcoholism is out of control in the hood. Black men drinking their problems away. Only problem is the problems never go away. Cigarette smoking is out of control. Two or three packs a day, some brothers. Even the ones who go to church or to the mosque. Strung out on cigarettes, strung out on hard crack, heroin. Marijuana addiction. 
So many black men self-medicating their problems through controlled substances. You don't want to face your demons, so you're going to smoke them away. You don't want to face your demons, so you're going to drink them away. Do you not understand the root of all addiction is doing something maladaptive to deal with a problem that you ain't got the willpower to confront once and for all? All addictions, all addictions come from the fact that we don't want to go through the problem, we want to go around the problem. The quickest way to deal with my pain is to grab that bottle. But you've got to realize that once you come off that high, those problems are right back. When people come to me for therapy, there's two things I always tell them. Number one, I cannot solve your problems. I am your tour guide through your problems, but you're going to solve them. And if you're not motivated to deal with your personal mental issues, then there's no need to give me your money. You might as well exit my office now. Because I am not a psychic, I am a psychologist. I can help you heal, but I cannot fix you without your participation. The second thing I tell them is we're going to have to go through a lot of things you've been through in your life that you ain't thought about, that you suppressed, that you don't want to deal with. But understand this, it will be well worth it. Because in order to get to emotional heaven, you've got to go through psychological hell. And most of us don't like to go through our psychological hell. That's why we grab the cigarettes and the alcohol and the marijuana. You young brothers in college, don't you develop a habit of self-medicating your problems away. Confront them. See, it's difficult to get men to seek out therapy. Men of any race do not like to go to therapy. Not white men, not brown men, not black men. The reason we don't like to go to mental therapy is because we feel that it is a knock on our manhood because we've been socialized to believe that we're never supposed to feel pain. So we keep on suppressing and suppressing the pain to the point that it explodes through suicide or addictions. Brothers, it's okay to talk to somebody. You have to, because when you don't release some of that emotional anguish, your brain gets so stuffed up and clouded by it that one day it crashes into a nervous breakdown. What is a nervous breakdown? A nervous breakdown is when someone who believes that they're so strong forgets to remember that they are still a human being. And one day, they're walking down the street talking to themselves. Or they're out in the middle of the intersection, totally naked with no clothing on. And people are driving by saying he was the strongest brother I ever knew in Memphis. But he had a nervous breakdown because the brain can only take so much. And if you don't take a break, the brain will take a break. It will shut down, create an alternative personality. And now you're acting like someone you're not because the original you needs to take a vacation. And if you don't give yourself a vacation, the brain will take one for you. It's called nervous breakdown. And some people never come back from it. They stay in that alter ego for the rest of their life. Yes. So brother, sometimes you got to get that mental health treatment. You got to get a therapist, a counselor, a licensed professional counselor. I'm not too big on psychiatrists because they just want to write prescriptions all the time and I don't want to make your problems worse. Right. So try not to, you know, get influenced to take the Zoloft and the Prozac and the Paxil. I don't want you on that because those psychiatric medications come with a lot of very debilitating side effects. In fact, they have their own addiction. You be on them long enough, you won't be able to get off of them. Okay, panic attacks and psychotic issues, diabetes, blood problems, organ dysfunction, suicidality, and a whole bunch of other issues. If I was in control, there wouldn't even be no psychiatric meds. Because I think there's more problems that come from the medicine than without the medicine. But I understand why black men don't seek therapy. I understand why black women don't seek therapy because psychology played a major role in creating racism in Jim Crow. It was the psychologists who were the architects of white supremacy. I just came from South Africa, a 30-day speaking tour in South Africa. Verwood, one of the statesmen of South Africa, created apartheid here in the United States of America. Henry H. Goddard and many of the fathers of white psychology, uh, they gave birth to racism in Jim Crow. It was the psychologists who said black people were half monkey and half human. It was the psychologists who said we were intellectually inferior to white folks. So I understand why we don't go because we have a distrust of that system 
But brother, you got to know when it's time to talk to somebody. That's why I always say, if you ain't got nobody to talk to, you will have my number when we leave here today. You can always talk to me. That's right, you can text me and say, Dr. Umar, listen, I got something going on in my life. I don't know if I'm going to make it seven more days. Can you please give me a call so we can have a conversation? And it's not all about the psychotherapy. Let me be clear. It's not the psychotherapy that helps me. It's the relationship. It's the relationship. That's why pastors can sometimes do a better job working with us than a licensed psychologist can. Because the relationship, 85% of the progress in treatment comes from the relationship, not the psychological techniques or orientation of the therapist. It's the relationship. A lot of black men still suffer from childhood issues, fatherlessness, sexual abuse, abandonment being fostered out and adopted out. Those problems don't go away. See, one thing we need to understand about the mind, your body will get older all by itself. Your body will mature all by itself. One day you're 10, then you're 20, then you're 30. But you need to understand that the mind does not mature all by itself. You have to force that growth. And if you went through something in your childhood that you never faced, guess what? You can still be emotionally that age. You can still be stuck at five because you had needs at five that were not fulfilled by your parents. You can still be stuck at 15 because you had needs at 15 that were not fulfilled by your parents. Many of us are emotionally stuck at a younger age because the needs that that age required have not yet been met. This is why when people date, I say you always have to investigate your partner's psychological age, not just their physical age. He might be a 40-year-old man physically, but he might be a 12-year-old man mentally. You gotta investigate the psychological age. And sexual abuse of black men is another issue that goes unaddressed a whole lot. A lot of black men have been victims of sexual abuse and they've never talked to nobody about it. Brothers, you gotta talk about that stuff. I know it's painful, but you gotta get it out because psychic energy don't go away because we stop thinking about it. It will go some way deep into the recesses of your mind, and it will manifest as another problem, particularly domestic violence against women if a woman was the perpetrator. And that's another issue that got to be dealt with. Black men are beating up our women, in many cases more than the men of other races do. Domestic violence is a very big problem in the black community. The church don't do anything about it. The mass jig doesn't do anything about it. Pastors and imams know who the abusing spouses are, but they're too cowardly to do anything about it. And then black men, excuse me, black women don't say anything about it, understandably, because number one, domestic abuse is a felony in most states. And so most black women don't want to have to tell their children that I'm the reason your daddy is locked up for 10 years. So they suffer in silence. So many black women suffering in silence from domestic abuse from men who can't keep their hands to themselves. In some cases, the roots of that domestic violence goes back to your own relationship with your own mother and your own father. It may have been modeled by the men in your life who role model to you that the best way to control women, not that you should be trying to, is through physical abuse. It's a very big issue. And the reason black men are so susceptible to domestic violence is because we are victims of so much economic violence. See, a black man is not allowed to be a man nowhere except at home. He can't be a man at a job. He can't be a man in court. He can't be a man when he can stop by the police. A black man is not allowed to realize his manhood anywhere in a safe way in this society except at home. And when we go home, what do we do? We take all the pain of the world and release it on the only people who genuinely care about us, our wives and our children. A very big issue, which is why I'm a very big proponent of family therapy too. Family therapy is also important, but you need to be careful. You don't just run out and find any old therapist. You got to interview your therapist. This is another mistake we make. We'll call and the first therapist we get, we run to. No. Interview the therapist. Not everybody is good in this work. Not all psychologists are trained to be therapists. 
So you need to interview them. How much experience do you have working with black men? How much experience do you have working with black women? How much experience do you have working with black families? How much experience do you have working with abuse? How much experience do you have working with addictions? Not everybody is expert in everything, but a psychologist will take your money if you're foolish enough to not do any questions to find out exactly who they are and what they are about. Black men, we gotta spend more time with our children. This is another big issue. ADHD, you wanna know why we got so much ADHD? Because it ain't no daddy at home disorder, ADHD. The fathers are not on their job, even when they live there. Because we always chasing the hustle. I'm on my grind. I gotta go get this money, fam. <laughs> I understand the grind, but guess what? That cannot replace the intimate time that the children need. That cannot replace the intimate time that your wife needs. Women don't cheat for sex and they lead to sex, but women don't generally cheat for sex. They cheat because you're not putting in time. When you forget to put in time with your son, he will go to school and become a class clown. He's not clowning just the clown, he's clowning because he has a need for attention that you are not meeting. And when your daughter don't get enough time for daddy, she get thirsty. And she run out there in them streets and end up pregnant at 15. And now you're ready to wring the neck of the young brother who got her pregnant when you should be looking in the mirror blaming yourself. You're the reason that your teenage daughter got pregnant. I'm going to say it again. Teenage pregnancy is not the mother's fault. It is the father's fault. Girls do not get pregnant because they're thirsty for sex. They get pregnant because they're thirsty for validation from dad that was never given. So they're looking for anybody to replace it. 95% of teenage pregnancy is fatherless girls or girls with fathers who don't spend time with them. Remember, the mother teaches your daughter how to be a woman. The mother teaches your daughter how to be a woman, but it's the father who validates a woman. It is the father who baptizes his daughter into woman. You got to love up on that little girl so she don't feel the need to get loved up on by one of them little boys. You got to put the time in with your little girl so she don't feel the need to spend so much time with them little boys to the extent that she don't do. She will find a surrogate to replace you. Black men, as we go, so goes our whole community. We got a big issue with each other known as ego, E-G-O. You got it on the college campuses. You got it amongst the college organizations. You got it amongst the fraternities. You got it amongst the professional groups. You got it amongst black men on the street corners, ego. Why black men have such a big issue with each other when it comes to ego? Everybody hating on each other. You know what it is? Because our psychological castration, being victimized by racism, not being allowed to be men, has led us to believe that the only men we can actually be superior over is other black men. And so we have this petty need to constantly subdue, dominate, intimidate, disrespect, condemn, belittle, and criticize other black men. Look at the hip hop world. The whole culture is based on criticism. Every rap song is about attacking another rapper. The whole culture, we no different in the streets. This is the same thing. I have to look better than you. I have to be better than you. Where the humility at? Because we need each other. Ain't no other man gonna be able to look out for his brother the way a black man can look out for his brother. In fact, I argue that every community we need to have healing circles for black men where black men can come together and just talk without nobody trying to shove a religion down our throats. See, that's part of the problem. Every time we go somewhere, somebody wants to shove a religion down somebody's throat. <laughs> or a political ideology down somebody's throat. Are you, are you Christian brother? Are you Muslim brother? Are you Pan-Africanist brother? Are you Hebrew brother? Are you Nation of Islam, brother? Are you Socialist, brother? Are you Nawabian, brother? What difference does that make? The brother hurt me and he need our support. I don't care about his religion or ideological persuasions. 
That's the problem of the black conscious community right now. Black conscious community is in a state of crisis because everybody wants to change how everybody else thinks, what they believe. We worse than the church. The church don't start criticizing until after you've been there for a few weeks. <laughs> the conscious community start criticizing the first time they meet you. You see the brothers all over YouTube fighting, wrestling each other, intellectual masturbation all day long, YouTube. A whole bunch of useless fights over questions that are totally irrelevant. Who built the pyramids, brother? What's better, being a vegan or a beach vegetarian, brother? Incense or shea butter, brother? Should it be a veggie wrap or a green smoothie, brother? See, when you deal with self-hate, anytime you have self-hate, even the positive stuff will be used as weapons. Which is why I say you cannot educate black people out of self-hate. I totally disagree. That's what the Afrocentric scholars say. If we teach our people where they come from, they will stop hating. That is so incorrect. Sheikh Anna Joe was the greatest anthropologist the world ever seen. He was black, but he was the greatest, period. Black or white. He still had a white wife. <coughs> Louis Latter, the excellent, had a white wife. My ancestor, Frederick Douglass, second wife, white. Knowledge yourself don't replace I didn't condition. Know that. Frederick Douglass, white from white. That's the reason why I want to build the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy for our boys. Because you got to socialize self-hate out of black folks. You just can't give them a book. If you come to me and you suffer from depression and I give you a book about depression and you read that book and that book teaches you everything about depression, will the book heal the depression? No. You come to me with a marijuana addiction and I give you a book about the marijuana addiction and you read everything about marijuana addiction, does knowing about your addiction heal it? The knowledge is necessary, it's a prerequisite, it's critical, but it's, it's not sufficient. You got to socialize this. Slavery was socialization. They didn't give you a book to make you hate yourself. They put you through a ritualistic set of behaviors every day, mental and physical. They made it unconscious. That's why we have such a difficult time controlling our self-hate, because it's unconscious. You got to make the unconscious. You have to reverse slavery the same way they made slavery, and that is through socialization. Which is why I say the most important function of the school is not to teach. The most important function of the school is to socialize, to teach our boys how to get along with other boys. That's why I'm not a big fan of online school. Everybody say, I'm going to put my kid online school, cyber charter school. I don't support that nonsense. Because half of all learning is inter interaction. Half of all learning is socialization. If I'm teaching a child, they have a question right here, right now. If they got to wait until they send me an email and get my email back, they might forget what it was in the moment that they had the question. Learning is on the spot. It's not here me and email your questions. But the reason online education is so popular is because it is cost efficient. Online school, I don't need no teachers. Online school, I don't need no school building. Online school, I don't need no lunches and insurance. Online school is very cost efficient. That's why they push it. Because it's cost efficient. It don't benefit our kids learning online. Somebody said, why don't you do your FDMG online? I cannot control how that parent is taking my curriculum and feeding it to their children. I am not in that house. I would never do nothing like that. Our children need to feel us. Black people need to learn how to get along and interact with each other. And that's one of the threats of the social networking age. It's putting space between black folks. You in the next room, instead of going to the next room, you're going to text them. Right across the street, instead of going across the street to interact, you want to send a tweet. 
So now the technology becomes a conduit for black folks to communicate to people who already got enough communication problems. Brothers, we have to become more economically self-sufficient. We have to come up with strategies and means by which we can help black men create their own jobs. Create their own. It's going to be very important that we do this. A lot of our brothers coming out of prison are so intelligent, so well self-taught, with all this ability and knowledge that they accumulated for years behind bars, but they have nobody to invest in them financially, which is why the black community has to build banks. And all of you who go to church on Sunday, you need to demand of your pastors that they build banks. Build banks so black men can have an opportunity to realize their financial dreams. Build banks. We 150 years out of slavery, and we still only own 1% of all the wealth in America. We 150 years after slavery ended, and we still only own 1% of all the wealth in America. And you tell me that you're free. What exactly are you free to do? Marry white girls, what are you free to do? What are you free to do? No wealth. We need wealth. Not sneakers and cars. We need wealth. 75% of what we spend our money in depreciates over time. We need wealth. Black men got to get a little bit more discipline with our spending and our finances. What did Will Smith say? Black people spend too much money trying to impress people we don't even like, buying stuff we don't even need. Going into debt just for floss over another black person. We wake up trying to outdo the next black person. Our whole existence. We don't even go to college to get a good education. We go to college to get a degree so I can get a nice car, ride down a block full of poor people and look like I'm special. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, if we don't change the way we think, we're not going to get out of the 21st century. We need a whole new paradigm shift. A, a new one. Black men are going to have to unite economically. We don't have a choice. We're going to have to build our own credit unions and savings and loan institutions. Y'all going to have to start sacrificing your Christmas money and use it on better things. Okay. In Philadelphia, we're about to spend $3 billion on Christmas. That's Philadelphia alone. Black Philadelphia, $3 billion. Black Memphis, you're probably one and a half billion. New York City is probably like 20 billion. This is how much we spend from Thanksgiving to Christmas Day. In four weeks, in four weeks, we dispose of over 50% of our leftover income after bills. In four weeks after Christmas, you won't even be using the stuff that you bought for Christmas. <laughs> Caught up in social hypnosis. Young men, make sure you don't get caught up in social hypnosis. What is social hypnosis? Doing it because everybody else does it. Get out of social hypnosis. Black people got a bad habit of social hypnosis. I see black parents raise their kids because of what other parents let their kids do. Social hypnosis. Black men dressing because of the way other men dress. Social hypnosis. Black women doing what other women do. Social hypnosis. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it correct. It doesn't make it aggressive. Get out of social hypnosis. Get out of social hypnosis. You know, as I travel the world, I notice that there's five constants for black folks, no matter where you go in the world. I don't care if you're in South Africa. I don't care if you're in Kenya. I don't care if you're in Jamaica. I don't care if you're in the UK. I don't care if you're in Paris. I don't care if you're in France or Holland, Brooklyn, New York, Memphis, Los Angeles, Houston. Toronto, Montreal, London, Manchester, anywhere in the world, there's five things that are consistent amongst black folks, all seven continents. Number one, unemployed black men. Everywhere you go in the world, black men are unemployed, sitting around doing nothing. Number two, black women raising our kids without the fathers. This is an international reality. It is not just America, it's everywhere. Number three, a white Jesus. I'm serious. Everywhere in the world, we 
are still praying to a white Jesus. 1482. The fourth constant is our economy is being controlled by another group of people who do not look like us. I don't care where you go on the planet Earth, black people do not control their economy nowhere in the world, even in Africa. That's right. You go to the store, if it ain't the Mexicans selling it, it's the Arabs. If it ain't the Arabs selling it, it's the East Indians. If it ain't the East Indians selling it, it's the Chinese. If it ain't the Chinese, it's the European Jews. If it ain't the Jews, it's the Irish. If it ain't the Irish, it's the Italians. If it ain't the Italians, it's the Lebanese, but it ain't you. This is global. This is global. And the fifth thing that you see wherever you go in the world is that we do not have access to capital to build the things that we want to build. See, the reason other cultures can come to Memphis and build in Memphis quicker and more powerfully than us is they have access to capital. Chinese show up with a line of credit from the Bank of China. East Indians show up with a line of credit. If they don't get the credit from the native bank, they can walk into any bank in Tennessee and get $3 million loan, $2 million loan. Only been here a month, they got two hotels. Only been here a week, got five gas stations. Only been here a year, 24 stop and go selling dirty food in 40 ounces. And you're like, how do you get all this? Because they got access to capital. But you go into these banks, they do what systematically redline you. And if there's one thing I've never seen black people ask any presidential candidate for, if there's one thing I've never seen black people ask any govern governor candidate or U.S. Senate candidate, is what are you going to do to guarantee black people access to wealth and economic opportunity? We never ask that question. We want to know what they're going to do about civil rights. You want to buy a house out in the white suburb. That's your concern. Civil rights. I want to be able to work in the Donald Trump White House. Civil rights. When are you going to put black history in the schools for black kids? Civil rights. I'm not fighting for black history in the public schools. I will never fight for black history in the public schools. I said this at an ASCAP conference. I said it at the uh, INCOBRA reparations conference. I said, no. The scholars rushed in on me. They said, Doc, what do you mean? How could you of all people say you don't support black history being taught in the public schools? The reason I don't support black history being taught in the public schools because white teachers ain't got no business teaching black kids where they come from. That's why I don't support them. You see the Chinese begging for Chinese history in American public schools? I don't want nobody teaching my daughter who she is. That's my job. But black folks are so lazy, even the things you should do, you want other people to do it. Why would you want somebody of another race telling your child who Martin Luther King was? Why would you want somebody of another race telling your child who Malcolm X was? You're giving them the power of historical interpretation. They can damage your child's mind about their own people for the rest of their life. When do you decide what's your job and when do you decide what somebody else's job is? Manhood ain't easy. You're going to go through some hell being a man. You're going to go up and you're going to go down, but you got to have enough faith to know that when you go down, you'll come back up. Never give up the faith. Whatever your religion is, cling to it. If you don't have a religion, you better build a relationship with supreme consciousness one way or the other. I don't think you necessarily need to have a religion, but you need to have faith. And if you don't believe in God, you better find a damn good substitute. Because <laughs> you're going to need something to hold you over in this world. For my young brothers here, because I see some young brothers, I want y'all to read more. I got to spend more time reading. Parents, you got to make sure they spend more time reading. My college brothers, y'all got to spend more time reading too. It's very important. We read for four reasons. Reason number one, when you read, you improve your vernacular. 
you improve your working vocabulary. And improving your working vocabulary, you improve the way that you think and process information. Reading makes you more articulate. When you read, your brain automatically soaks up information. It automatically soaks up new words. And one day you're engaged in a conversation and you're using words you didn't even know you knew because your brain automatically did the work for you. You read because when you read, you improve your knowledge of the world, general facts and information. When you read, you improve your ability to communicate with the ink pen. When you read, you improve your ability to communicate orally. Now think about this. When are you going to need to improve your knowledge of general information? When are you going to need to be able to write well? When are you going to need to be able to speak well? When are you going to need to be able to master vocabulary when you take standardized assessments? A lot of our parents think putting your kids out in private schools in the suburbs subjects the black child to a better education. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reason our children do better sometimes when they go to white private schools is for two reasons. Number one, in white private schools, they will be expected to read more. They will be made to read more. And simply by engaging and processing more literature, guess what? Their intelligence levels will go up. Their speaking skills will go up. It's not that they're getting a better education. They are around a level and quality of language that they were not exposed to in the hood. This is why IQ scores are subject to environment and quality of education. So all we have to do is improve the language that we speak around our children and improve the amount of time that they spend reading. And we can also improve how well that they do in school. And we also have to make sure that our homes are academically supported. When I go into homes to do therapy, I regularly see homes without a dictionary. I regularly see homes without a thesaurus. I regularly see homes without an encyclopedia. How do you not have a complete encyclopedia in your home, but you got every video game, every cell phone, every HDTV, and internet? So you're one of those parents that when your child has a question, you give them the answer instead of making them find the answer. You're not supposed to tell them how to spell a word. You're supposed to give them a dictionary. They find it out themselves. You're not supposed to tell them about a certain person, you're supposed to give them the encyclopedia and make them find out. Children don't drop out of school until the parents drop out of their lives. And there's something else that has to be dealt with when you deal with black men. That is the fact that we have abandoned the industrial building trades as a, as a sincere opportunity to earn a decent living. All black men are going to college now. Nothing wrong with college, I got six degrees myself. But I also understand that a college degree ain't going to feed everybody's family. What's wrong with being a carpenter? What's wrong with being a plumber? What's wrong with being an electrician? What's wrong with being a mason? What's wrong with being an auto mechanic? What's wrong with being a chef? Now, don't get me wrong. If a child wants to be a doctor, they need to go to college. He wants to be an engineer, he needs to go to college. But what if you have a son who doesn't necessarily want to be something that requires a college education. I wanted to be a psychologist. It requires a college education. But if you have a son who's not wedded to a particular career, mother and father, why are you forcing college? Why are you forcing student loan debt on a child who don't even want it? When two years he can go to a trade school. Two years he can go to a trade school. Minimum student loan damage. Minimal student loan damage. Now he has his own electrical business. He has his own plumbing business. He has his own carpentry business. Psychologists work in the office. Doctors work in the office. But who built that office? There's electricity in here. Who put that in there? There's air conditioning in here. Who did the HVAC work? And I'm willing to bet the person who did the electricity, the person who did the HVAC, the person who did the plumbing, the person who did the carpentry, probably make as much money as the person who's going to work in that office when they're done. <laughs> I know electricians who make more than uh, doctors. I know auto mechanics who make more than surgeons. 
I know plumbers who make more than engineers. Why are we abandoning the industrial building trades? And you know what we're doing? We're creating a vacuum where all the industrial building contracts from the city are going to be going to Chinese, Mexican, and white construction companies because we don't have the paperwork. In other words, you're going to see millions of black men with college degrees standing on the corner looking at men with trade skills building the buildings. And you know when this happened? This goes back to 1968 after the FBI assassinated Dr. Martin Luther King in this city. April 4th, in this city. And I hope all you brothers have been to the National Civil Rights Museum. If you ain't been to the National Civil Rights Museum and you live here, something's seriously wrong with you. <laughs> the National Civil Rights Museum is the hotel where Dr. King was murdered. It's the hotel where Dr. King was murdered. Here in Memphis, the Devon Lorraine Hotel, that's now the National Civil Rights Museum. You need to go because I think it's one of the best museums in the world. There's about five museums, and I've been all over the world. I think that's one of the best. The Apartheid Museum in South Africa is one of the best. You have to go to it. The National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis is one of the best. The Great Blacks of Wax Museum in Baltimore is one of the best. And I'm still coming up with my, with my last two. When I get back up to Philly next week, I have to go to the new African American History Museum in D.C. to see what that looks like, but I'm a little concerned because I got a funny feeling of what I'm going to see. I think the bottom floor is going to start with slavery, and the top floor is going to end in Obama and say, You have arrived. <laughs> so I'm scared to go because I think I'll be, you know what I mean, Osana? I think that's what it's going to be. I think they're going to show how he went through all this Jim Crow, but now we got a black president, we have arrived. And black folks, I'm upset with y'all. I don't know what y'all mad at Trump for. Because Obama did nothing for you for eight years. Obama did nothing. We let the black bourgeoisie motivate us to put Obama on a pedestal. We put Obama on a pedestal. We put him inside of a wrapping container that said, do not touch or criticize for eight years. That's what we did. I said, listen, we got to ask him to do something for us. No, leave him alone. He's the first. He don't have to do nothing. He's black. That's enough. He got there. That's what Negroes were saying. My son has a role model. Really? You just told me the man ain't got no power to make no changes, but he's your son's role model. How you put them two together? <laughs> so it's okay for your son to be a powerless puppet black man who does nothing for his people. He's a role model. <laughs> Hillary didn't lose because she was Hillary. Hillary lost because Obama was black. That's right. America said we've had enough of this eight-year experiment. It's time to clean out the White House. Let them take the bed home with them. I don't care who the Democratic nominee would have been, they would have lost. I don't care who it would have been. America demanded a total transformation and eradication of all black energy from the Oval Office. It was also an exclamation point to let Obama know that you still ain't one of us. Obama said, I need y'all to do one last thing for me. Put Hillary in office and that will seal my presidents. He said, we got you. <laughs> That's going to seal it. We going to unseal it. Obama hurt because he can't believe all he did. But y'all would disrespect his legacy by putting Trump. Do you understand that for people to choose Trump after Obama, a man with no political experience, that is a statement to Obama that the people do not consider you to have been in their best interest. I was about to say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I don't want to do I'm not going to lie, every time I come to Memphis, I'm not going to lie. 
I call up Dr. King. I say, Doc, I got to go to your city for two weeks. <laughs> Right. We was in uh, South Carolina last week, and the whole church went black. The lights went out. I'll show you. Here we go again. <laughs> See? But it was a reminder to Obama that you ain't one of us. Sometimes black folk, we elevate so much within the mainstream of America, we start thinking they forget that we black. Obama start forgetting. So they put Trump in it and remind him you are to nothing. <laughs> and his fellas is her. Hillary. Oh God, I think Hillary might. Hillary needs some therapy. <laughs> because Hillary was the choice. She did everything right. She met with the Bilderbergs. But the reason they couldn't give Hillary the office is because the mainstream, white America, were so fed up with status quo politics and with the Clintons being the poster family for status quo politics, although they chose her, because presidents are chosen four years in advance, not on election night, although they chose Hillary, the people of America spoke and said, you will not, if you do this, if you follow up a black Democrat with another Democrat, we might have a civil war. And you heard what Donald Trump said. He said, if you steal my election, I will fight you all the way to the end. And Bubba and all them, we're going to fight you too. <laughs> they couldn't steal that election from Trump. See, they stole it from Al Gore back in 2000. Yeah. Al Gore beat George Bush. But George Bush got the White House because of two electoral college votes. Al Gore was crushed, but he couldn't do nothing about it. But to placate Al Gore, they gave him a Nobel Peace Prize for saving the environment. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. He said, listen, we got to give him something because this was wrong. You can't do that to Donald Trump. He don't be studying the environment. <laughs> you rob Donald Trump of the White House, it might be something. See, he was supposed to be a joke. He was never supposed to be legitimate. But when a rich white man got poor white folks behind him, it changed the game. He was never supposed to get that amount of support from poor and working class white folks. And when he did, it shook the system. That's why CNN was trying to kill Donald Trump's reputation. Every time he got accused of rape, he got accused of not paying tax, he owed people at the Trump. Every day it was like, boom, because they had to try to change your mind. The purpose of the media is to influence the people to support the person that the power structure already pre-selected. But it was not working. Hillary should have ran against Obama for the Democratic nomination his second term. That was her best shot. Obama wasn't doing well. He just bailed out Wall Street, the biggest bailout ever. Three wars was going on when he said he was going to end them all. She should have ran against him then. She waited, thinking that she would still be all right because the powers that be said, we got you. But they did not know. They underestimated the Trump factor. And now he's in. Y'all worried about him. He ain't not, I'm not worried about him. I'm worried about the people he's putting around. Yeah. Newt Gingrich? Yeah. Rudy Giuliani? Yeah. These straight hillbillies. Yeah. And y'all not getting nothing. Y'all can forget it. Black folks can forget it. You never tell the world that a president don't have to respond to your needs because he's black. That is ridiculous. And now that Obama didn't have to do nothing for black folks, guess what? Trump ain't got to do nothing for black folks. We set ourselves up. And if you notice when they talk about the post-election racism, have you noticed they don't even talk about racism against blacks? They talk about Arab racism, sexism against women, East Indian racism. They're not even, they're not even dealing with black folks. You took yourself off the table for Obama and got nothing for him. Everybody got something from Obama but us. White women got the Equal Pay Act. Homosexuals got free laws. The immigrants got certain protections. Everybody got something from Obama except black folks. I don't want to see another black president ever. <laughs> Unless it's Bill Cosby. <laughs> So brothers and sisters, 
as I begin to wind this down, I need to say to my parents in here, we're in the middle of the school year, but we're almost in the middle of the school year. I need y'all to pull back on the special education. I need y'all to stop getting the black boys evaluated and diagnosed. It's not helping them. You can't talk about black men unless you talk about black boys. You can't talk about black women unless you talk about this special education machine. It's a machine. Diagnosing your son with a learning disability, it's a machine. And the sad thing about it is that the learning disability is a joke, it is an opinion, it is not a fact, so why are you going for it? True. Somebody tell you, oh, I got a reading disability, you cannot prove that. A math disability, you cannot prove that. Emotional disturb, you cannot, ADHD, you cannot prove that. What's wrong with us? Mild mental retardation, you cannot prove that. Do you realize half the black kids in special ed are in special ed for diagnoses you can't even prove? Somebody tells you your daughter got a reading disability? That's an opinion. You can't prove a reading disability. When I evaluate a child, you give the child an IQ test, achievement test, psychological measure, visual, uh, visual motor assessment, and all the tests give me a scores. Ask any psychologist. What do the tests give you? Does the test give you a diagnosis? What do the tests give A score, a number. I have to take the number and interpret it. And I determine, based on these numbers, I think the child is reading the same. Based on these numbers, I think the child is ADHD. Based on these numbers, I think the child got a math problem. I can't prove it. And the sad thing about it, the difference between a black kid in special ed and a black kid not in special ed is the difference between a black parent who made them work a little bit harder and one who did not. Mm. It's really that simple. It's not that the kids can't learn how to read. They don't want to learn. It's not that they can't learn how to count, they don't want to. And I'm so sick and tired of black boys growing up thinking that all they can be is an athlete and an entertainer. You young bucks over there, I don't want to hear about no more sports. I'm tired of it. Everybody want to be a basketball player, football player. I need y'all to understand something. And y'all two stop touching each other, it ain't that type of party. I want y'all to understand something. Only 1% of high school athletes will become professional. Only 1% of high school athletes will become professional. Only 1%. That's it. 99% of you young brothers will be going professional in something other than athletics and entertainment. I need y'all to know this. I need y'all to know this. Parents, y'all need to make sure they understand this. And black fathers, I need you to stop trying to relive your life through your son's athletic ability. Good had a father tell me, my son's six foot five. I was one of the best high school players in the city. He don't want to play no ball. What's wrong with my son? No, what's wrong with you? Just because the boy's six foot five, if he don't want to play ball, he ain't got to play ball. Stop trying to live through him. You don't want to wear them Speedos and Chuck Tellers like you did. Leave that boy alone. <laughs> Fathers, sometimes it can be difficult to get along with the mothers of our children. Oh, yeah. Man, we need some therapy in here. But when that happens, we have to make sure we separate gracefully. If you and the mother cannot work out the relationship problems, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to have a meeting. You and the mother, mm -hmm. with the children, together, or separately. Y'all yes. two are together, but the children can be together or separately depending on what the age range. Turn to your daughter and say, listen, I love your mother. Even if you don't, I love your mother. <laughs> but sometimes people have to separate for different reasons. Sometimes it can become difficult for two people who truly love themselves to live under the same roof. Your mother and I decided to have this meeting with you because I'm going to be moving out in the next 30 years. And I know you've grown up with your father under the same roof as you your entire life. And this transition may be difficult for you and your sister and your other brothers and sisters, so we wanted to prepare you for this. We want to assure you that the reason that we're getting a divorce has nothing to do with you. 
It has nothing to do with you getting in trouble in school. It has nothing to do with you being disrespectful. It has nothing to do with your grades, nothing to do with your behavior. This is about us, but it will affect you. I still love this woman. She gave me my children. She gave me you. You will still see us together at report cards. You will still see us together when you graduate. You will still see us together at birthday parties. You will still see us together at different important events in your life because although we will no longer be together, we will still work together to raise you because you are our priority. This is what we're supposed to do. And then you ask the child, do you have any questions for your mother and I? And they may say, why y'all breaking up? That is none of your concern. <laughs> Do not tell your son that your mother cheated on me. <laughs> I'm serious. Sometimes we tell the children adult business that is none of their concern. <laughs> Same thing for the mothers. Don't tell your daughter your father was thirsty for Miss Honor. Don't do that. It's none of your concern why we broke up. We just need you to know that it wasn't because of you. And why do you have to tell them that it wasn't because of them? Because children are egocentric. That means what? They think everything you do is about them. My dad left my mom because I got suspended. My mom left my dad because I ain't make the cheerleading team. They will think this because they're egocentric. So you have to let them know it has nothing to do with you. And then you give your child a hug. And then you give the mom a hug. Let me tell you what I don't like. I don't like when our children find out that daddy is no longer with mom when they see daddy with another woman. That's not how they're supposed to find out. When they see mom with another man, that's not how they're supposed to find out. That is the most traumatizing thing when you've lived under the same roof with one man and one woman and all of a sudden, you see mom with another man. All of a sudden, you see dad with another woman, and neither one of you prepared you for that. We got to respect our children more than what we do. And it's nothing worse than a child who never sees his dad and mother again in the same space and time. You ever see that? I've never seen my mom and dad together. Even if they come to the game, she's on that corner, he's on that corner. That's not right. Because you know what that tells our children? That even Adults can't work their problems out. Even adults can't put their differences to the side for the best interests of children. If we can lay down the makeup, we better be able to stand up the race. It's very important. Divorce can be traumatizing to the mind of a child. It can be very traumatizing to the mind of a child. Very, very, very. Brothers and sisters, you all know that I've been working to build the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy for our boys. For my young men in college, if you want to work at the school, send me a resume. <clears throat> Folks who are not in college, you want to work at the school, you can send me a resume. The Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy will be the world's first academy dedicated to teaching our sons the principles of revolutionary pan-African nationalism and international economics. That means that by the time your child has done their 14th year, ninth grade, they will not do their own taxes. By the time they've done their 15th year, 10th grade, they will already have a business plan. By the time they've done their 16th year, 11th grade, they will be trading stock on Wall Street. By the time they graduate, they will have mastered real estate in their native hometown. The school is based on the premise that if you understand how money works, if you understand the laws of money, you can become financially empowered without a college degree. I'm not against college. My boys will be more than prepared for college for those who want to major in careers that require it. But for my young brothers who don't necessarily want to be something that requires a college education, we will give them another avenue through financial empowerment. I want the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy to be a residential school. They will live there, they will sleep there. This is important because education should not stop at 3 o'clock. At 3 o'clock when they get out of school using this, they're going to learn how to use these. 
3 to 3 o'clock until dinner time on Monday, they learn how to fix cars. 3 o'clock until dinner time on Tuesday, they learn how to farm in agriculture. 3 o'clock until dinner on Wednesday, they learn in African martial arts. You understand? So you guys know I've been raising money for this initiative for about two years. We raised over seven hundred thousand dollars in that amount of time. We'll probably be crossing a thousand, a million, excuse me, by New Year's. So I've already started to look for a school, first school. You guys know I wanted to get St. Paul's College, but they still want two million dollars. They will not drop the price, and they have not been taking care of that building. St. Paul's College was a historically black college opened by a friend of Booker T. Washington during Reconstruction. It's now closed, three, four years now. It's just sitting there. It would be the perfect place for the school. But because they're not taking care of the school, even if we raise $2 million, we're going to have to put another $2 million into the school to make it operable. So now what I think I'm going to do is I'm either going to build a school in Africa, the Caribbean, or just start with a regular school here in the States. So I speak in Columbus, Georgia on Tuesday for the first time. There's a school in Georgia for sale. So the day after my lecture, I'm going to take the two, three hour drive go look at the school for sale. I heard it's a nice large school with a lot of acreage around it in case we need to expand. But even if you know of schools here in Memphis in the Tennessee area that are sitting there that has land around it, it must have land around it. I don't need no school that's boxed in by other buildings. I don't want that. I need some land, space to grow. You know of a school, take a picture of it, send me the picture, send me the contact information for the realtor who can get me access to that school, who knows how much it costs. First school could be anywhere. I'm not landlocked. I'm not tied into any particular region of the country. It can literally be anywhere. So I need y'all to help me find that school. But I've committed that in 2017, we will have the first Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. And depending on how much operating capital we have at that time, we'll determine which grades we will actually begin with. We won't have enough money to do K-12 straight out. That will be the long-term goal, a K-12 Academy. But if I have to shrink it to begin with, we'll do somewhere between the grades of second and seventh, because that's when we tend to use most of our boys. Most black boys psychologically drop out before they physically drop out. And psychological dropout takes place between the second grade and the seventh grade. So we will begin somewhere in there, and we will use a lottery system to draft the boys. If we don't have enough capital to do the residential component of the school, we will do a regular day school until we have enough funds to build the residential academy around it. If you want to work at the school, send me your resume, fdmgresumes at gmail.com. Not only do we need math teachers and science teachers and history teachers, okay, we also need secretaries, we need security guards, we need lunchroom staff, we need sisters who know how to do natural hair because when we opened up the girls' academy, Anna Douglas, Amy Garvey Academy, all the girls got to come to the school 100% nappy by nature. No weave, no wig, no perm, no extensions, no European hair color. Same thing for the boys, too, because some of y'all getting trumped up. I need y'all to trump it back down. I need people who can do natural in vegan food preparation because the school's diet will be 80% raw and vegan, 80%, yeah. okay? So you don't need to be a certified teacher to prepare, prepare raw and vegan food. You just need to know how to make it taste right so my kids will eat it, do you understand? <laughs> I need brothers know how to cut hair because we're gonna have a barbering department where the boys get their hair cut and also learn how to cut hair. I went to a military school. At the military school, they told us how to cut hair and we would cut the young kids, you understand? So I haven't been to a barbershop since I was about 15 years old, except occasionally when I go to different cities, I might let the barbers cut my hair if they know what they're doing for once, once in a while. Okay? We also want to need brothers and sisters who do African martial arts. We need people who know real estate, who know the stock market. Lunchroom staff, as I said, I'm in these house parents that live with the children in the dormitories. I got a brother in North Carolina. He is a shellfish fisherman. He's going to come to the school and teach the children how to fish for scallops and clams and oysters. And we will have a fish fry once a month. 
I got another brother, he knows how to make shoes. He wants to teach the children how to make shoes. Every child in the school will be wearing their own schools, own shoes, excuse me. I also need people to know how to sew and manufacture clothing because the children are going to have to make their own uniforms. Okay? So whatever talent you have, if you have a talent that you know can benefit our children, put together a resume and put your talent up there. I can come to the Fred Douglas and Marcus Garvey Academy and teach your children how to do this or how to do that. And if I consider that to be critical, I will find a place for you. No teaching license required. Okay? We do gotta do a child abuse. Cause some of y'all got freaky beaky issues. We gotta do a child abuse clearance. Make sure you ain't been playing with nobody's kids. Let's keep it real. Megan's Law. But that's what we're doing. Although the first school will be an all-male school, we will have male and female teachers. I need that to be said. Why would we have male and female teachers? Because you gotta have the masculine and feminine energy balance. A lot of our boys have issues with women, so we need that to be worked out. Okay? So we want to teach economic science, we want to teach political and military science. Why is Africa the richest continent in the world, but the people are the poorest? Answer real simple. During the 1960s independence fights in Africa and the Caribbean, after we fought to get the British out and the French out and the Germans out and everyone else out, when they left, they forced the freedom fighters to sign these contracts that allowed the wealth of the country to remain in the hands of a former colonizer. So let's take South Africa. When apartheid fell in South Africa in 1994, the Afrikaans and the British of South Africa owned 95% of the diamonds and the gold of South Africa 22 years ago. Well, guess what? Today, the Afrikaans, which are the Dutch who came down, and the British still own 95% of South Africa's wealth. Nothing changed when it came to the power and the money. The government of South Africa doesn't own a single bank. The government of South Africa doesn't own a single mine. When independence came, all they gave them was a vote, a flag, and a national anthem. No power transformation. This happened with 95% of African countries. This is why Africa is still backwards, even though it's rich. It's not because our people don't know how to make it right. It's because the people who invaded Africa still control Africa to this day. It hurt my heart when I was in the Caribbean yesterday. Speaking at the men's conference, the young African children stood up and they sung the national anthem. And guess how the national anthem in Turks and Caicos starts? God bless our queen, the great Victoria. This is the anthem. I don't know what you want out for, you still praying to a white Jesus, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but Turks and Caicos is not an independent country. They're still a colony. So you still got colonies. Puerto Rico, a colony of America. St. Thomas is a colony of America. You still got a lot of colonies out there who didn't fight for independence. And the reason why a lot of these countries still are not independent is they don't think they can make it without the white man helping them. The self-hate. And then after the colonizer leaves Africa, you need some money. You're a new African country. I need money. I need schools. I need houses. I need health care. You call Obama up. World Bank International Monetary Fund. Obama says you need $10 million. We got $10 million. But there's three things you got to do for this money. Number one, we're going to charge you a 1,000% interest on the loan. You'll never pay it off. That's why the more money Africa get, the worse Africa is. She goes further into debt. Who can pay off a 1,000% interest rate? Number two, free market economy. They say, you want this loan? You have to open up your markets to foreign investment. Hmm. What does that mean? Why, I just why, came why, from Turks and Caicos, right? right? In Turks and Caicos, they make salt and seafood. Salt and seafood. So if I'm the president of Turks and Caicos, guess what? I'm not going to let nobody come into my country and sell salt and seafood because we have our own, right? So I'm going to protect the seafood industry and I'm going to protect the salt industry. So 
I can guarantee some of my people will get jobs. I will guarantee an economy. But guess what Obama's going to say? Or Queen Victoria? Guess what they're going to say? They're going to say, no. If I give you this $10 million, you got to have a free market economy. That means what? That means Morton Salt can come in and sell their salt. And all the different salt companies can come in and sell their salt. Same thing in Kenya. Kenya makes tea. Kenya wants to protect the tea. But Obama said, you take this loan, you got to let Tebley Tea come in. What's all the tea companies in America? Lipton. Lipton Tea can come in. What's going to happen if Lipton Tea come into